Shalom. Welcome to our Romans class. This should be the final installment, uh, Lesson 5. Lesson 5 will be going through uh, chapters 14 through the end of the book. Uh, <clears throat> if you haven't seen the previous portions, you'll want to uh, start with Part 1 and work your way up here to Part 5. So Part 5, we're in Romans chapter 14. And uh, um, Romans chapter 14, like so much of Romans, is a very misunderstood passage or section of portion of text. It says, Now to him who is weak in trust, give a hand, and have no doubt in your reasoning. For there is one who trusts or has faith that he may eat everything, but he who is weak eats vegetarian is uh, the way it's translated in the Hebraic roots version it could also it's literally vegetables okay um, now that one who eats should not trust with com contempt that one who does not eat with contempt for that one who does not eat and that one who does not eat should not judge that one who eats for Elohim, or Eloah, has received him. Who are you that you judge a servant who is not your own? Who, if he stands, stands before his adone. If he falls, he falls before his adone. But we will indeed stand, uh, stand, for it will be by the hands of his adone that he will be established. Let's, let's pause there for a moment. What the issue being dealt with here is, and it's so commonly misinterpreted and misunderstood, is not the kosher laws. In fact, that's very clear in verse 2. He who is weak eats vegetarian. It is doctrinal vegetarianism. Doctrinal vegetarianism was a very real issue in the first century. And as we have said before, our mission here is to understand the book of Romans from the original uh, Hebrew and Aramaic, well actually Aramaic in the case of Romans, uh, and the, uh, of the Hebrew text from which it refers, uh, from the original Hebrew and Aramaic, in, uh, um, uh, by applying Jewish hermeneutics and uh, Hermeneutics are the, uh, the methods of understanding the text. And finally, um, to understand the text in continuity with Second Temple era Judaism. Okay? So, there was a very real issue of doctrinal, vegetarian that, doctrinal vegetarianism that was taking place in the first century. Uh, there was a group of Essenes called Nazareans. Nazareans should not be confused with Nazarenes. It looks alike in Hebrew, but it's actually, the two words have nothing to do with each other. Um, it looks alike in English, I mean. Uh, the, the words in English look alike, Nazareans and Nazarenes. Um, and sometimes because of um, influences from Latin languages like Spanish, the two especially get confused, okay? Nazareans and Nazareans, because the, the, S, the uh, S is pronounced uh, with a, a Z, so uh, in, uh, in Spanish and Hispanic and Latin languages. Okay. Um, the Nazareans were... Um, is, uh, different from the Nazarenes because Epiphanius explains who the Nazareans were. Epiphanius was a fourth century so called church father. Uh, Epiphanius was, um, he wrote a book called Panarion, which was a list of heresies. Um, not just a list of heresies from his perspective as a Catholic, Roman Catholic Christian, but um, his, uh, a list of heresies and an explanation. Uh, of what each of them uh, was, sort of a catalog, and uh, an encyclopedia, if you will, of, of, uh, 
what he considered apostate movements. In the opening of his book, he gives a list of seven Jewish sects uh, that he says that existed, quote, before the incarnation of Messiah in Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, he says that in Panarion 14.1.1. And so one of these seven sects that he goes on to describe in Panarion 18 is the Nazareans. But it's very important to understand the Nazareans were not Nazarenes. They were a sect that existed prior to the time of Messiah. Okay? And, uh, by the way, as with the other parts, you should hopefully have your um, handouts for this part of Romans, which, uh, if you're watching the video, watching the video, you should be able to download, hopefully, um, uh, from, uh, if, you, if not, find them on NazareneJudaism.com or uh, Nazarene Space. Okay. Either go to NazareneJudaism.com to find the videos, or they'll initially be put on Nazarene Space, and you'll have the video and in the uh, um, and the uh, um, handouts as PDF right there. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, go to NazareneSpace.com or NazareneJudaism.com and find the Romans uh, through the Book of Romans video teaching, and there you will find the uh, um, uh, the PDFs. Okay, so um, as I said, the uh, the Nazareans they were probably a type of Essene, um, and we're not doing a study on the Nazareans, so I'm not going to go into the all the reasons that we have for believing that the Nazareans were related to the Essenes, but uh, or were a type a subcategory of Essene, but that appears to be the case, and the the Nazareans. According to Epiphanius in Panarion 18.1.4, he says they keep all the Jewish observances, but did not sacrifice or partake of animal flesh. Rather, it was unlawful for them to eat meat or offer sacrifice with it. That's Panarion 18.1.4. Okay, so um, these Essenes, these uh, Nazarene Essenes, did not eat meat. They were doctrinal vegetarians. This was definitely an issue in uh, amongst the early Nazareans. Nazarenes, because uh, the Nazarenes, and there's a whole different teaching here, but the Nazarenes, uh, most of the Nazarenes were former Essenes or Pharisees. In fact, I won't even say former, because Paul referred to himself and said, I am a Pharisee. Paul said, I am a Pharisee, in the present tense, while he was a Nazarene. And there's good evidence that the first Nazarenes were, in fact, people that had come from the Essene background. Uh, again, I'll probably do a whole video series on, on some of that material another time. But there were people that had come, definitely had come into the movement as Nazarenes that had come from an Essene background, and some of them had this Nazarene baggage, if you will. Okay? And so they had this Nazarene baggage background that they brought with them. And some of them, around 70 AD or 70 CE, left. And when they left, they took some of these Nazarene uh, ideas with them, um, and they left to form a group called the Ebionites. Um, the uh, um, Epiphanius describes the Ebionites in Panarion 30. By the way, backing up a little bit here, the Nazareans are described by Epiphanius in Panarion 18, but the Nazarenes were described by Epiphanius in Panarion 29. So clearly they weren't the same people or the same group. And I, and I say that because there is a, um, a bizarre group out there of Neo-Essenes that quote Panarion 18 in reference to the Nazareans and try and apply it to the Nazarenes and make sure that that's absolutely understood that they were totally different groups. Okay, um, so who were the Ebionites? 
let's skip down to the bottom of our handout. I've got a little section here that says, who were the Ebionites? Um, and then we'll talk about what the Ebionites believed here. Go back up a little bit. Who were the Ebionites? Um, Epiphanius in Panarion 30 starts out saying, next comes Ebion, the founder of the Ebionites. He held doctrines like those of the Nazarenes, being from their sect. So he was a former Nazarene. Although what he taught and proclaimed differed from what they did. So uh, Ebion had been a Nazarene and he uh, disagreed with some Nazarene things and so he went and started a new sect and the new sect became known as Ebionites. Uh, a lot of people confuse the Nazarenes with the Ebionites, even scholars sadly enough. But if you look at what the so-called church fathers say about Ebionites and what they say about Nazarenes, it's very clear that they were not the same group at all. Uh, the, uh, um, the Nazarenes, for example, held that Paul was uh, um, not only an emissary, but that they actually saw him as being prophesied of in the book of Isaiah. Um, whereas the Ebionites believed Paul was a, uh, a false teacher and they rejected his writings altogether. Um, and there's many other issues about which they, they uh, disagreed. And it can be shown that they clearly disagreed. Again, that's another teaching. Point is, Ebionites were not were not Nazarenes, but they had been. They were a split off from the Nazarenes in seventy. Epiphanius Panarion thirty to uh, uh, thirty section thirty uh, two seven says their sect began after the capture of Jerusalem. That'd be seventy C.E. For when all those who believed in Messiah settled at that time, for the most part in Berea, a city called in a city called Pella, that provided an opportunity for Ebion. They, Nazarenes and Ebionites, do in fact differ from each other. And that's uh, um, I mean that's a plain statement from Epiphanius. They differed from each other. They weren't the same. Okay. One of the things about the Ebionites is that like these Nazareans, these Nazarene Essenes, and the Ebionites appear to have been people that were from an Essene background, or influenced strongly by people from an Essene background. Um, Epiphanius in Panarion 13.4.5 says, going back up towards the top of our handout, in the gospel that is in general use among them, talking about the Ebionites, Ebionites, which is called according to Matthew, which however is not whole and complete, but forged and mutilated, they call it the Hebrews gospel. It is reported, it came to pass that John was baptizing, and there went out to him Pharisees, and were baptized, and all of Jerusalem. And John had a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his food, as it was said, was wild honey, the taste of which was like that of manna, a cake dipped in oil. Thus they dissolved to pervert the truth into a lie and put a cake in place of locusts. Now if you look at canonical Matthew, uh, also Mark and Luke, I believe it's in Mark, definitely in Luke, um, if you look I'm not sure. It's in Matthew and Mark. It's in the Synoptic Gospels. I know it's in Matthew. Um, it says that Yeshua, that uh, Yochanan's food, one of his uh, components of his food, was locusts. Locusts and wild honey. And I believe this is in at least two of the Synoptics. Matthew and either Mark or Luke. Maybe all three. Okay, so... Um, the Ebionites, in their version of the text, had changed locusts to instead say that the honey, instead cake, the uh, changed the word locust to cakes, um, dipped in oil to describe uh, the uh, uh, in, in the wild honey instead of the uh, um, locusts. This was because apparently the Ebionites, we learn other passages, the Ebionites had carried on this Nazarean um, idea of doctrinal vegetarianism. Um, Panarion 30, 
22.4 again says they, talking about the Ebionites, abandon the proper sequence of the words and pervert the saying as is plain to all from the reading attached and have let the disciples say, where will you have us prepare the Passover? And ask him and, uh, and him to answer to you that, do I desire with desire at this Passover to eat flesh with you? Okay, so whereas the canonical text that we have, uh, his Talmudim come to him and they say, where do we prepare the Passover for you? Um, uh, and instead of giving a, a straight, uh, the, the answer that we see in our canonical text, they actually change things around. Instead of saying, I desire to, uh, to eat the Passover with you, he, he, they have him say, do I desire to eat flesh with you? In other words, uh, they have him questioning whether he would uh, eat vegetable uh, meat because they were, of course, uh, vegetarians. Um, I don't have it here, but there's another passage that the uh, Essenes had changed, or the Ebionites had changed, that he mentions in Canarion uh, 30, where uh, he uh, indicates that sacrifices and offerings shouldn't be done. And of course, that's in keeping with the Nazarene teaching as well. Okay, so um, Paul was dealing with this issue in the first century. There were these people who had come from this Essene background or been influenced by this Essene, particularly Nazarene Essene background, that were wrapped up in this doctrinal vegetarianism. Of course, the Torah doesn't teach vegetarianism. In fact, uh, the Torah actually requires, at least when a temple is standing and the Passover sacrifice can be made, specifically requires the eating of meat, uh, the eating of the Passover lamb once a year. And certainly, the Torah could have been a lot less cumbersome describing which animals were clean and unclean uh, in the Torah if, in fact, uh, we should be doctrinal vegetarians. But this was the, uh, uh, the teaching of the, this uh, particular first century group, and they were all hung up about it. And so Paul is uh, addressing this issue. And he's saying, hey, if these people feel convicted that they shouldn't eat meat, um, other than, of course, the Passover lamb, then, you know, uh, if, if, if they feel that they would be, you know, that Elohim doesn't want them to do that, then they shouldn't do that. Okay? Um, but really what Paul's issue here in chapter 14, as we will continue on, is to address some of these issues and remember chapter 13, which we covered last time, the topic of chapter 13 was that uh, was the authority of the governing uh, body of elders, basically. And so um, Paul talks about this also in Colossians chapter 2, um, where it is, if it's read translated correctly, um, this issue that these kinds of issues are actually under the authority of the elders. We don't just run into a congregation with some bizarre idea that you shouldn't eat meat and start teaching that. Um, we don't set halacha as uh, individuals that come up with some new bizarre revelation or, or, or with some baggage from our last uh, religious experience or whatever. Um, so that's one of the points that Paul is making if you bring chapters 13 and 14 together. So then chapter 5, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 5, there is one who judges a day from a day, and there is one who judges all day. His nephesh, his nephesh is his soul. What does this mean? Well, these very same Essenes had calendar issues. They had... Uh, um, been experimenting apparently with uh, trying to make a solar calendar work. And I could do a whole teaching on on that too in the Book of Enoch. In fact, we will do a series on the Book of Enoch soon um, and ultimately deal with that issue. But the Book of Enoch presented a calendar that had been a pre-flood calendar. And in the pre-flood, before, uh, not only before the flood, but before the fallen angels, okay? 
And there, there's a whole teaching there, but things changed. The way the luminaries and the heavens moved changed. And um, as a result, um, the lunar months and the solar year no longer coincided perfectly. And uh, as a result, the Enoch calendar doesn't work. Okay. Uh, the Qumran community and the Essenes appeared to have experimented with trying to make it work and go back to a solar calendar and re-implement or implement a solar pure solar calendar um, and there were problems apparently we there's issues and debates as to whether they ever made it work made a, a workable solar calendar or not but the, the issue here is they had calendar disputes okay they had calendar disputes and this is also addressed in, in Colossians chapter 2 and if you understand Colossians chapter 2 properly and it's properly translated um, and we'll do a teaching on Colossians. It's saying that that is not an issue that individuals come in and make a fuss about. We have uh, a, a, a council of elders, and we have a big dean, and we have uh, an established uh, authority structure uh, to weed through these issues and deal with these issues um, in an organized manner, uh, not with individuals coming in making uh, trouble. Now, add to this also a group of people that existed in the first century that are described by Philo, who had, their, had a, an interesting doctrinal teaching. Um, and what their doctrinal teaching was, was that every day was a festival. It wasn't, at least in, in its intent, it wasn't to lower festival days to that of the mundane, but rather the intent was the opposite, was, was to say this is the day that he has made and that means every day and that every day was to be celebrated as if it was a festival. And uh, Philo talks about these people at length in uh, his special, on special laws, 2.42.53. And that's your next handout. It says, there is one who judges all days, Romans 14, 5. <clears throat> it says, the law, Philo says, the law sets down every day as a festival, adapting itself to an irreproachable life, as if men continually obeyed nature and her injunctions. And if wickedness did not prosper, subduing by their predominant influence all those reasonings about what things might be expedient which they had driven out of the soul of each individual. But if all the powers of the virtues remained in all represents, uh, respects unsubdued, then the whole time from a man's birth to his death would be one uninterrupted festival. And all houses in every city would pass their time in continual fearlessness and peace, being full of every imaginable blessing, enjoying perfect tranquility. Um, you can read the whole thing for your spell. I'm going to skip down to uh, part, the end of part 46, just before you get to 47, where it says, the whole of their lives as a festival. Well, um, and then uh, uh, under section 48, so that no time would ever cease to be the time of a happy life, but that the whole circle of the year would be one festival. This is a whole teaching here that you may want to study in your own time. Um, I, I think it's too long and cumbersome for us to go through together on the video, but you should have the, the handout. And it's uh, Philo of Alexandria. Um, he was a first century Jewish writer who lived in Alexandria. Um, on special laws to uh, parts 42 through 53. And uh, it should be there in your handouts or you can look it up in Philo. So Philo 
talks about this group of people that had this teaching that really every day should be a festival. Um, now the argument can be made that every day is a festival, then what you've effect done is not so much risen uh, every day to being a festival, but lowered every day to the mundane, uh, the festival days to the mundane. Um, so there's, you know, arguments back and forth to be made on that. The point is that this was a real debate in the first century that was going on, and there was this teaching that was circulating around that, uh, hey, every day is a festival. And so um, uh, with calendar disputes that were taking place, uh, particularly between uh, uh, among certain groups of Essenes and people that had come from the Pharisaic background, um, and uh, um, uh, then these people that Philo talks about that uh, said, hey, every day is a festival, and so on. Uh, these were disputes that were taking place and a threat to the early Nazarene community. And so Paul's addressing this in verse 5. There's one who judges a day from a day, and there's one who judges all days. But let each man be assured in the thoughts of his nephesh. He who is mindful of a day is mindful of it before his adon. And everyone who is not mindful of a day is not mindful of it before his adon. In other words, we are responsible to adon for the days we keep and don't keep. And whoever eats, eats before his adon and thanks Eloah. And he who does not eat, does not eat before his Adona, Adon and thanks Eloah. So we are responsible to Elohim for what we eat. We are responsible for Elohim for what festivals we do and do not celebrate. You see what verse 6 is saying? Verse 6 is not saying it's a free-for-all. It doesn't matter. Verse 6 is saying we are answerable to Elohim for these things. For there is not a man from us who lives to his nephesh, and there is not a man who dies to his nephesh. In other words, we don't make these decisions for ourselves. Elohim makes them. But, that in mind, he's alluding to chapter 13, which has indicated that the arbiter of what Elohim, the, of, of, of Elohim's halacha, if you will, is the, uh, uh, the body that we read about last week, that's described in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that uh, is the uh, uh, council of elders, the judges that shall be in those days, that makes the appropriate halakha for the community. And this is, by the way, what Colossians chapter 2 is addressing as well. Because if we live, we live to our adon, and if we die, we die to our adon. And whether we live, therefore, or whether we die, we belong to our adon. Because of this also, by the way, this is therefore also not saying, as some have misinterpreted to say, especially those of the one faith to expression theology, this is not saying that, hey, you can keep Christmas and Easter, it doesn't matter. Pagan holidays are fine. Because Paul addresses pagan holidays in the book of Galatians. He's not talking about pagan holidays here. That's not even what he's talking about. What he's talking about is these first century disputes over this whether we use this uh, lunar calendar, or solar calendar, uh, whether uh, 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 the uh, Shavuot is, is observed on the 6th of Sivan or a Sunday. Uh, that was a first century dispute, it's a dispute we still have today in our own movements. Um, and, um, uh, and then this group that uh, was teaching that every day was a festival, the Philo mentions, okay? So he's dealing with these first century issues that were taking place within the movement. There was a first century issue of those who were trying to bring pagan holidays in. And he does, like I said, address that in the book of Galatians, and we'll cover it in the Galatians study. And he speaks very negatively about it. It's not what he's talking about here. Because of this, also, and he's also not saying, hey, take the Jewish festivals or leave them. Uh, Sabbath, Sunday, doesn't matter. He's not saying it doesn't matter. He's saying we're answerable to Elohim for these things, and um, that uh, the arbiter of these things for the community has been described in chapter 13 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Because of this also the Messiah died and is alive and is raised that he might be, uh, that he might be Yahweh to the dead and to the living. How did you judge your, how do you judge your brother? 
this is getting to the same topic as, uh, the, uh, that I said. How do you judge your brother? Or why also do you treat your brother with contempt? For all of us will stand before the Bema of the Messiah, or the judgment seat of the Messiah. So the Messiah will ultimately judge us for these things. And we do have an authority in place in the meantime, as described in chapter 13 of Romans, alluded to in chapter 13 of Romans, and described in Deuteronomy chapter 17. As it is written, I live, says Yahweh, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess to me. It's interesting how some of the, uh, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses and whatnot translate this Lord here in verse 11. But in, in the Aramaic it's Maria, which is Maria in the Aramaic is always used for Yahweh. Um, Mar means just Lord. So there's a distinction in the Aramaic between Yahweh and uh, Adon, or Yahweh and Master, which is why in other passages, uh, like in verse 4 uh, above, we said Adon, because the word there was um, um, uh, Mar. And in verse 11, the word is Marya. So I live, says Yahweh, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess. And if you actually look that up in Isaiah 45, 23, you'll see in context that the, uh, the word Lord there is Yahweh. But uh, I think the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses translates that just Lord. Verse 12, Therefore every man from us will give an account for his nephesh to Elohim. And that is the theme of chapter 14. The theme of chapter 14 is not Oh, well, it doesn't matter whether you keep Torah or don't keep Torah. It doesn't matter whether you keep Sukkot or don't keep Sukkot, or whether you keep the biblical festivals or don't keep them, or whether you eat kosher or don't eat kosher, or whether you keep the Sabbath or don't keep the Sabbath. It's saying it does matter. You're answerable to, one day you're going to answer to Elohim for whether you kept the Sabbath or didn't keep the Sabbath, whether you were keeping pagan festivals or not, whether you're keeping the biblical festivals or not. Okay? Therefore, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this, that you will not place a stumbling stone before your brother. So it's saying don't, don't individuals judge one another, and this is what Colossians 2 is saying. But rather, as we described in chapter 13, we actually have a, halach, a, a body that makes these determinations for us. We're organized. We're not disorganized. We're not in chaos. We're not bickering about these things. We have an organized way of dealing with these things in the community. And apart from that, you're just going to have to answer to Elohim. Verse 14, For I know and am persuaded by Yahweh, Yeshua, that there is not a thing that is defiled from itself. Now, what is he saying here? Some people misinterpret this. But he who thinks concerning a thing that is unclean, to him alone it is unclean. Um, by the way, the words unclean and defiled here in the Aramaic are two different words. What he is saying here is that I, uh, a thing doesn't be, isn't unclean just because I said it's unclean, or you know, I can't make things clean or unclean. Um, uh, uh, and no number of individuals can make things clean or unclean. Only Yahweh can make things clean or unclean. Um, so they're not clean or unclean in and of themselves. They're clean and unclean because Yahweh has made them clean or unclean. And if because of food you grieve your brother, you are not walking in love. But remember, the issue here is not even talking about the kosher, the kosher laws. The issue here is doctrinal vegetarianism. So if you have a brother that's a doctrinal vegetarian and uh, you're grieving him over it, not just uh, teaching the truth, but grieving him over it, then are, you're not walking in love. By, by your food, do not destroy him whose sake the Messiah died. Okay. And be not, and let not our good be blasphemed. For the kingdom of Eloah is not food and drink, but righteousness and shalom and joy in the Ruach HaKadosh. It's not saying that the kosher laws don't matter here. It's not even discussing the kosher laws. 
it's discussing uh, doctrinal vegetarianism. He who serves the Messiah in these things please Eloah and is approved before the sons of men. Now let us follow after Shalom and after the edification one with another. And let us not depart from the works of Eloah because of food. For everything is pure, yet it is wrong for a son of man who, is, who in stumbling eats. But remember, you must understand verse 20 in context here. It is not saying that, um, uh, obviously it's not contradicting the Torah. It's not saying that pork is pure. Okay. It's everything that it's talking about is pure. In other words, uh, meat is pure. Meat, both meat and vegetables are okay to eat. It's talking about doctrinal vegetarianism. And again, the context is set in verse 2. He who is weak eats vegetarian or eats vegetables. Vegetables only. All right, verse 21. It is good that we not eat flesh. It is good that we not eat flesh, nor drink neither wine nor anything by which our brother stumbles. Um, so, if we're going to uh, drive someone away by eating meat in front of them, and that disturbs them, then don't do it. Um, if we're going to drive them away by drinking wine, and that disturbs them, don't, don't drink wine in front of them. Okay? Um, so, somebody invites me over to their house and I know they're a doctrinal vegetarian. I don't bring some, you know, uh, uh, meat sticks with me. <laughs> uh, I don't try and, uh, you know, uh, uh, twist the knife or whatever. I don't, if somebody uh, uh, is a, really opposed to drinking alcohol, then I'm, I, I know the Torah doesn't have a problem with drinking alcohol. Okay, wine is fine. But, in fact, maybe they're an alcoholic. Maybe it would be bad for them to drink alcohol. Um, but the point is, I shouldn't bring a bottle of wine over to, you know, when they invite me over for dinner. Okay? Uh, I should be at least respectful of them. You who have trust, keep in your nephesh before Eloa. Blessed is he who does not judge his nephesh in a thing that he distinguishes. For he who doubts and eats is condemned, because it is not in trust. For everything that is not from trust is sin. In other words, if I believe that it is wrong, that it would be wrong for me to eat a kosher steak, uh, because I'm a doctrinal vegetarian. Then, if I ate that kosher steak, it would actually be a sin for me to eat it. Not, not because the kosher steak was prohibited to me, but because I believed I, in my heart I was rebelling against Elohim. Okay, now Romans chapter 15. And really, with Romans 15 and 16, we're really starting to uh, wrap up the uh, um, uh, Paul's teaching. When then the strong ought to bear the infirmity, uh, we then the strong ought to bear the infirmity of the weak. That's another interesting thing. This uh, chapter 13 and four, uh, 14 and 15 characterize these people that are doctrinal vegetarians or have these incorrect calendar issues as weak and not to please ourselves but a man from us should please his neighbor in good things as to edification because of this also the messiah pleased not his nephew has fallen upon me uh, psalm 69 10 or 69 9 for everything that was written from before was written for our instruction, that by the patience and by the comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Now the Elohim of patience and of comfort grants you to think in harmony with one another by Yeshua the Messiah. And with one mind and with one mouth, you might praise the Lord, the Father of our Adon, Yeshua the Messiah. This is, again, 
This is appealing to the unity of the body. Because of this, receive and bear up one another, as also the Messiah receives you to the glory of Eloah. Now I say that Yeshua the Messiah served the circumcision on behalf of the truth of Eloah, that he might confirm the promise of the fathers. And that the Goyim might glorify Eloah for, their, for the mercy which came to them. As it is written, I will confess you uh, among the Goyim, and I will sing to your name. 2 Samuel twenty-two fifty 50, and Psalm 18, uh, verse 50 or 49. And again, rejoice Goyim with his people. Deuteronomy 32, 43. And again, he said, Praise Yahweh, all you Goyim. Praise him, all the nations. Psalm 117, 1. And again, Yeshayahu said, There will be a root to Jesse, and there will, uh, and he will, ra will raise a ruler. Uh, he who will rise will be a ruler of the Goyim, and upon him the Goyim will hope. Uh, Isaiah 11.10 uh, Now the hope of uh, now the of hope will fill you with all joy and shalom and trust that you may abound in his hope by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. I want to I talk here particularly about this rejoice going in with his people, verse 10. Now as we studied earlier in the book of Romans, we talked about uh, chapter 11 and chapter 9 and chapter, well, 9 through 11, really. Um, Paul talks about the restoration of the house of Ephraim and uh, the house of Israel. And the, the Gentiles that he talks about in Romans 9 through 11 are really, if we uh, study it out, as we did, the, Eph the house of Israel, Ephraimites. Okay. But now here that we get to Romans chapter 15, verse 10, Paul is talking about the benefit that the Gentiles receive, the, and now I believe he's talking about real Gentiles because of all the, the and when I say real Gentiles, the house of Ephraim, the house of Israel had become Gentiles, as we read and studied out in the text. But all Gentiles actually then benefit from this whole grafting in process. And this is what's described here in uh, uh, this uh, chapter 15. There is a Midrash in Midrash Rabbah, in the Song of Songs Rabbah uh, 4.2, that uh, gives a very good explanation of how the return of the lost ten tribes and the, the grafting in of Ephraim um, also results in the gathering you know, of a great number of people from Gentile nations that were not Ephraimites at all, but who uh, benefit from and join in this wonderful restoration. And it says this, um, it says, this is your, th your third handout, by the way. They shall um, come uh, trembling as a bird out of Egypt. This refers to the generation of the wilderness and as a dove out of the land of Assyria, uh, Hosea 11.11. 11. This refers to the ten tribes, and of both of them it says, I will make them to dwell in their houses, saith the Lord. Rabbi says, when a certain kind of dove is given food, the other doves smell it and flock to her coat. So when the elder sits and discourses, many strange strangers become proselytes at such a time. So, for instance, Jethro heard the news and came. Rahab heard and came. So through Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, many strangers became proselytes at that time. What is the reason? Because when he sees his children sanctify my name, then as it goes on, they also that air and spirit shall come to understanding. So what this Mirosh is saying is that just like there's this uh, species of dove that when it finds food 
Uh, the other doves smell it and flock to the, that dove and uh, join in it and in, in enjoying that food together. So what happens is that when Ephraim receives the call to come out from Babylon and responds to that call and is grafted in, the other Gentiles who are not necessarily Ephraimites, may not necessarily be Ephraimites at all, uh, smell this, they sense this, they see it, and they want that too. And so they join them, and they are blessed just like the Ephraimites uh, are as well. And so this reconciles the old question, is Romans chapter 11 talking about Ephraimites, or is it talking about Gentiles in general? And the the, the, the question that has brought down the two-house movement to a certain extent or created a great deal of turmoil between the uh, mainline two-house movement and the mainline Michigan Jewish movement over uh, uh, whether the two-house theology is teaching um, uh, Israel replacement theology. That is to say that anyone who accepts Messiah and believes uh, and accepts the Torah and believes, does that person... Uh, does that mean that person was already an Ephraimite, or do they become an Ephraimite? And the reconciliation here in Romans chapter 15 is teaching us, and in uh, Romans chapters 11, uh, 9, 10, 11, and 15, and Romans inclusively, um, and also this Mirosh in Song of Songs Rabbah is teaching us that in fact um, those people who return are made up of Ephraimites and non-Ephraimites. But it really doesn't matter because they're all going to be grafted in anyway. Okay, So uh, they may or may not be Ephraimites, but they, when they become grafted in, then they um, uh, become uh, part of Am Yisrael. Not replacement, but they convert to, in my opinion, as I understand it, they convert to Nazarene Judaism. Okay, Just like a person might convert to rabbinic Judaism, okay, or Orthodox Judaism. Okay, uh, so back to chapter uh, 15, and uh, uh, verse 14. And I am persuaded also concerning you, my brothers, that you are full of goodness and are made perfect with all knowledge and are able to teach others. I have written somewhat boldly to you, my brothers, that I remind, might remind you by the favor that was given to me from Eloah that I should be a servant to Yeshua the Messiah among the Goyim and labor in the good news of Eloah so that the offering of the Goyim might be acceptable and sanctified in the Ruach HaKadosh. And these Goyim at this point are a combination. They're Ephraimites and non-Ephraimites, but they're, they're, they're all uh, 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 being called together. Therefore, I have boasting in Yeshua the Messiah before Eloah and I do not presume to speak of a thing that the Messiah has not accomplished by my hands for the obedience of, of the goyim in word and in deed. Well, in obedience, that's an interesting word here. Verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders and by the powers of the spirit of Eloah, how that from Yerushalayim I have traveled all the way to uh, Elycrium, and I have fulfilled the good news of the Messiah. While careful not to proclaim where the name of Messiah was called, lest I build upon a strange foundation. But, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see him, and those who have not heard will be persuaded. Isaiah 52, 15. Because of this, I have been prevented many times from coming to you. And this is really the wrap-up of Paul's letter now as he's going into the closing. Um, and, and this is the, where it goes to the part that I think is specific to the Roman community, uh, particularly that he is addressing. But now I have no place to those regions, and I have desired for many years before to come to you. When I go to Spain, I hope to come and see you, and that you will accompany me there after I have been refreshed in part by the sight of you. It was debate as to whether he ever got to Spain or not. Uh, it's generally accepted he didn't. However, um, there is a, uh, um, a 
neo-apocryphal 29th chapter of Acts that describes him going to Spain. I say neo-apocryphal because um, the uh, uh, the textual evidence is well against the authenticity of this 29th chapter. But some people are very uh, 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 very sold on the 29th chapter of Acts. Anyway. But now I am going to Yerushalayim that I might serve the set-apart ones. For those who are in Macedonia and Achaia desire to partake in sharing with the poor set-apart ones that are in Yerushalayim. They desired this because they are also indebted to them. In other words, they, they, they felt so indebted to the Jewish people in, in Jerusalem um, for the truth that, of Torah that they sent um, funds to to help those people. For if the Goyim have been partakers with them in the spirit, they are indebted that also they should serve them in the flesh. When therefore I have finished this, and have finished giving to them this fruit, I will cross over towards you on my way to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come to the fullness of the blessing of the good news of the Mashiach. Now I urge you, my brothers, by our Adon Yeshua the Messiah, and by the love of his spirit that you have uh, labor with me in prayer for me in Eloah, that I may also be delivered from those who are not persuaded, who are in Judea, and that the service that I carry to the set-apart ones that are in Jerusalem will be received well. And that I might come to you with joy by the will of Eloah and be refreshed with you, now the Elo of Shalom be with you all. Amen. We're going to stop our study there. Um, the uh, uh, chapter 16, uh, really, there's very little, there's, there's a little bit here we could talk about in chapter 16. Um, uh, most of it is bid Shalom to this person and that person. There is a little bit down here when we get down to... Um, uh, particularly when it talks about um, verse 17, we'll just call it. Go to, let's go down to verse 17. Uh, now I entreat you, my brothers, that you beware of those who cause divisions and scandals outside of the teaching that you have learned. This is really bringing back that issue that we talked about in chapter 14 of uh, uh, people coming in with hang-ups about vegetarianism and hang-ups about uh, uh, strange calendar issues, that you keep away from them. For those who are so do not serve our Adon Yeshua the Messiah, but their belly. And with sweet words and blessings, they turn away the hearts of the simple. But, you, but your obedience is known to every man. I rejoice, therefore, in you and want you to be wise to good and, in, and, in, and innocent to evil. And the Eloah of Shalom will soon crush Hasatan under your feet. That's a reference back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, the favor of our dome, Yeshua the Messiah, will be with you. Um, and then the rest of this is um, uh, really Paul's signing off. So We've completed our study of the book of Romans from chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 16. And uh, I hope you have a, a better understanding of Romans. You understand Romans is not anti-Torah uh, by any means. Uh, that Paul was not opposed to Torah. That the traditional interpretations of Romans have been just totally wrong. And that um, Romans can and should be understood in a Jewish context, in a context that does not conflict with Judaism, uh, that is in continuity with Second Temple era Judaism, and that the issues discussed in Romans are issues that were relevant to discussions that were taking place within Second Temple era Judaism of the first century. All right, so um, our uh, next study going through uh, uh, Paul's writings, we will. Uh, we're not doing them in order. We'll, we'll, uh, next, we're going to do a study on Galatians, uh, going through the book of Galatians. So uh, look in the future, in the near future, for, uh, for that study through the book of Galatians. Until then, Shalom.